Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good. What a magnificent gathering of atheists this weekend. Right? Give it up. I want to thank Dave Silverman and the staff at American Atheist for allowing me this opportunity to address you today. My name is Athena Solomon, and I represent Arizona's 26th legislative district in the House of Representatives. My speech today will highlight my story as an atheist in Arizona, why I ran for the State House of Representatives, and why we must commit to a powerful and an intersectional movement built on solidarity and love. I want everyone to take a pause and imagine the moment that thrust me into the national spotlight. April 18, 2017, on the 100th day of session in the Arizona legislature, an openly atheist legislator, me, gave a humanist invocation on the House floor to begin the day's business. That is where the story should have ended. <laughs> but unfortunately there's more to the story. Following my prayer, my Republican male colleagues took turns to question my motives, supplant my prayer with a Christian one, and ultimately rule my invocation out of order. In the midst of it, two of my Democratic colleagues, both articulate Native American women, stood in my defense. Their speeches were moving. I was shook, I was shocked. I couldn't focus for the rest of the day. With the help of Sarah Blaine and Evan Clark with the humanist firm Spectrum Experience and Tori Roberg with the local Secular Coalition affiliate, we decided that we needed to respond to this act of hate and organized a press conference titled Standing for Our First Freedom, Inspired by Our First Amendment Rights. We turned a moment of ugliness into an act of solidarity and love. The Phoenix Humanist community called upon interfaith allies, both locally and nationally, to support an atheist legislator. For the first time in my life, leaders of diverse faiths, from Islam to Christianity, stood up for my rights as a non-religious individual. In fact, Yukwala, a member of the Havasupai tribe in the Grand Canyon, drove four hours one way to the state capitol the morning of the press conference to include his blessings, and then drove back home immediately afterwards. This story is as much about me standing up for secular values in our government as it is for the interfaith community standing up for an atheist. Imagine this story where atheists stood alone, left to fend for themselves without solidarity. In fact, many of you have lived this story because for decades the secular community has been standing alone asking for legitimacy and equality and despite the derision and danger, this movement has been at the forefront of building the wall of separation between religion and government. Even as recently as 2013, when then Representative Juan Mendez came out as an atheist on the floor of the Arizona State House, he stood largely alone. Exactly one reporter came to the press conference following his first humanist invocation. There was no one from the faith community and just a handful of dedicated secularists who we love. But between that first atheist invocation and my own, the secular movement in Arizona has become intersectional. Arizona's secular coalition has been a mighty voice at the Capitol for LGBTQ and women's rights. We have stood alongside the religious community in supporting sanctuary for our immigrants. We have stood against the hate that targets the Muslim community, and we have stood for religious freedom of all Arizonans. Because we have stood with the faith community, they have come to trust us, and now they stand with us. By putting ourselves in a space of vulnerability, we are able to listen, to grow, and to build strong relationships with one another. This is the space where love is born, and this country is in desperately need of love right now. It is in the spirit of love that I ran for public office. Today, I stand before you as the only openly atheist female state legislature, legislator in the country. <laughs> 
I just realized how big this room is. <laughs> Thank you. I am also the first Palestinian American elected to serve in the Arizona State Legislature and currently the only woman serving in there under the age of 30. Can you guys clap after every sentence? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Rarely do people with my background get the opportunity to serve in elected office. For you to understand someone like me and why I have chosen to lead inclusively, you need to begin with my parents. My mother was born in Chicago to a German mother and Mexican father, both immigrants who had met one another in an English class. I learned compassion and courage through witnessing her overcome poverty and violence that plagued her childhood. My father was born in the West Bank in Palestine. Listening to stories about life under an occupation where he lived as a second class citizen on the very lands cultivated by his ancestors, I learned never to take freedom in this country for granted. Both my parents taught me pride in my diverse ethnic background. My extended family, consisting of atheists, Christians, and Muslims, taught me to celebrate the differences in our faith. Together, it was part of what we believe made our family great. I am born and raised in Arizona. I grew up as an atheist person of color in a middle class, predominantly white neighborhood, Christian neighborhood in Phoenix. I knew at a very young age I was different and I was grateful for my uniqueness. However, this wasn't something that my peers or teachers always appreciated, nor did it always make me feel safe. The microaggressions and systemic discrimination towards women, Arabs, Latinos, and atheists have always been present in my community. But nothing felt as intense to me as in the aftermath of September 11th. I'm just gonna cry through it. <laughs> Knowing that something tragic was unfolding, my mom wanted it to feel as normal of a day as possible. Oh crap, I'm gonna run out of time. <laughs> I didn't uh, practice crying, I didn't budget for that time. <laughs> Um, for my two brothers and I, although she knew that no matter what, it would be an abnormal day. I was 12 years old in middle school and unprepared for the intensity of bigotry I would face. My teachers preached hate and violence towards people who shared similar backgrounds with the attackers. One teacher went as far as to say that Quote, the solution to the Middle East is to nuke it. I watched in horror, visually, my, visualizing my sweet Palestinian grandmother in the West Bank as my peers nodded in agreement. The comments were hurtful, but the abuse of an authoritative platform, that of a teacher, is what pained me the most. My older brother had it worse. He was in high school, and he was shoved, spit on, called racial slurs by his peers. The school did nothing to intervene. Fortunately for my younger brother, who was in elementary school, the only thing significant about that day were the horrific images we saw on TV. Four days later, my friend's uncle, Balbir Singh Sodi, a Sikh man wearing a turban, was murdered outside of his gas station nearby because he was mistaken for an Arab. I remember my friend sobbing at lunchtime as she tried to comprehend the news of her uncle's death. I remember thinking to myself, wow, that could happen to my family too. It was and still is tragic. It was the first in a wave of hate crimes as retaliation for the attacks. 
exacerbated by the fear-based rhetoric employed by the Bush administration with a deleterious agenda to start a war on false pretenses, expand the strength of corporations, and empower the religious right. For eight years, I endured alongside my family de facto and de jure and discrimination. De facto because we were followed at airports and my brothers and father were profiled by the police. De jure because we were placed on the selective screening list, presumed to be terrorists because of our Arab last name. I'll never forget in 2003 when we showed up to the airport ready to get our boarding passes when the flight attendant lied to us about not having a reservation, then refused to give us our passes, called her manager who called security, all while refusing to explain to us what was going on. They demanded to see our IDs and since I was still a kid, all I had at the time was a middle school ID. The process took so long, I almost, we almost missed our flight. Being on the watch list was unsettling because A, I am a natural born American citizen. B, we had no criminal records. C, we were never formally notified. Through extensive research did the description of this list match the barriers I faced while traveling via flight. I'm telling you guys, it's not like the government's like, hello, Athena Solomon, uh, we just put you on this list just so you know. <laughs> just bam, it's in your face. And D, this is the most disturbing part. The complicity of my friends who thought it was all right that I was on this list because it made them feel safer. As long as they were not inconvenienced and targeted, it did not matter to them that my civil rights were being eroded. I grew up being told by my teachers that racism no longer existed, that sexism was a thing of the past. I'm sure some of you were told this as well. Contrary to their beliefs, Having come of age under the repressive Bush regime gave me lucid awareness of the fragility of our rights in America. If my rights could be violated by the state, then given the right conditions, for example, what we're seeing today, anyone's rights could be taken away for any reason. Most importantly, I'll always remember the feeling of isolation that no politician, neither Democrat nor Republican, had my back at that time. Everyone here knows this feeling of isolation because regardless of your race, class, ability, sex, sexual orientation, or gender, we are here together as atheists. And to be an atheist is to know the rarity in which we are publicly or positively acknowledged in any place in the world, including in America. One moment of recognition came in 2009 when newly elected President Barack Obama delivered the graduation invocation at Arizona State University. I was moved to tears when the President of the United States mentioned atheists positively in his speech. I don't even remember the context in which he dropped our name. I just remember the feeling of being seen. It was powerful. The overall problem of exclusion and discrimination keeps perpetuating, perpetuating itself on multiple fronts due to the lack of diversity in positions of power, especially in elected office. It is critically important that we understand systemic oppression not only in theory, but in practice as well. Analyzing it empowers us with the tools to deconstruct and pave way for equality and equity. We need to look no further than the state of representation in America to see how and why oppression manifests. According to Represent 2020, a scorecard for immigrant leadership in America by the New American Leaders Project, while the US population is 17% Latino and 5% Asian Pacific Islander and 62% white, Congress is 81% white. In fact, only 2% of the 500,000 available elected offices in the United States are held by Asian Pacific Islanders and Latinos. According to the Pew Research Center, half of the non-white population in Congress is black. Women comprise of over half the population. This one, I didn't have to pull up any stats. It's kind of a given. Um, but just 19% of Congress comprises of women. Not one single state legislature in America has Asian Pacific Islander, Latino, or female representation proportionate to its population. And including, or according to the National Council of State Legislator, Legislatures, there is no state legislature this year that even exceeded 40% in female representation. 40%. 
Meanwhile, the Pew Research Center has revealed that 5% of Americans identify as atheists and is expected to grow. That's a good thing, everyone. <laughs> In Arizona, the numbers of nuns with no religious preference is much higher. When it comes to representation in my state, the numbers fare slightly better. 28% of our legislature is Latino. This is including myself and a couple other multiracial Latinos. 39% female, 1% black, 1% Asian Pacific Islander, 1% Arab, you're looking at her. 3% uh, LGBTQ and 2% openly atheist. There's more than one of us. <laughs> How does this translate into impact? Candidate diversity influences which voters and issues are prioritized in elections. Research shows that when voters see themselves reflected in their elected officials, their participation and trust in government increases. In my district's primary alone, voter turnout increased 30%, especially in precincts that were dominated by people of color. In government, a lack of diversity also decides which positions are non-negotiable and which are compromisable. In simpler terms, without a seat at the dinner table, you are most definitely on the menu. Finally, a lack of diversity limits the potential pool for other qu otherwise qualified and good candidates. This is true both in the public sector and the private sector. If you can't see it, how can you become it? And what environment must you navigate as a minority? A Girl Scout Research Institute report in 2014 titled Running for a Change, Girls in Politics Pulse Poll found that while girls ages 11 through 17 were overwhelmingly interested in politics, the majority ag agree that, quote, if I went into a career in politics, I'd have to work several times harder than a man to be taken seriously. Does that sound familiar? And while girls see male and female politicians as equally capable, they notice how the media depicts female politicians very negatively. The girls report that they feel less encouraged to pursue a career in politics than their male counter counterparts. Quote, politics is still a man's world, end quote, is what the girls said. And the girls are right. To this day, men still have a monopoly on government and politics. They have a monopoly on corporate power they have a monopoly on global wealth. My entire life, I found myself in the minority. In light of this, y'all might be wondering, how does someone like me run for public office? The answer is timing, resistance, and persistence. The timing. Originally, in the spring of 2015, I was planning on running for an open seat on the local community college governing board since I had previous experience advocating for college access and affordability. I was already enrolled in a couple of candidate training programs to build my skills and confidence to run for office. Later in the fall, my state senator announced that he would be vacating his seat and moving to Nevada. At this point, I was more interested in seeing how the appointment to fill his vacancy would pan out than running myself. In Arizona, each district consists of two House seats and one Senate seat. The Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, which at the time comprised and still does comprise of only men and mostly Republicans, uh, and I'm in a Democratic district, these are Democratic seats, um, appointed our white male state representative to the Senate, even though he had the least amount of local support out of the three total nominees. This created a new vacancy in the House, and somewhere along the way, I decided I'm going for that. <laughs> and that's what we do in Arizona. Um, <laughs> this, uh, at this point, so, so I was nominated alongside two other women. At this point, it should be no surprise that the Caucasian woman um, who received the least amount of votes from the local community was appointed to fill the open seat. Additionally, one supervisor privately lamented that he believed there were more qualified in the district and was disappointed that we instead sent him only women to choose from. That leads me to the resistance. I come from people who have resisted occupations, survived wars, and overcome homelessness, among many other obstacles. As a young woman of color, my mere existence in a traditionally conservative state is constantly under attack and being disrespected. But without my struggle, without knowing my family's sacrifices, and without dreams of a better future, 
My will to fight simply wouldn't exist. Prior to the outcome of the House appointment, I knew that no matter what, I was going to run for the State House of Representatives, to the dismay of several party establishment people inside and outside my district. In my eyes, it was not what I considered a racist and sexist board of supervisors who should decide our district's leadership, but ultimately the voters themselves. District 26, my district, is a majority minority district, which means that the majority of our residents are people of color. I made two bold decisions for my campaign. First, I decided to run on a full slate with Isela Blanc for the second House seat and Juan Mendez for the Senate. If elected, Isela, originally born in Mexico, would become the first formerly undocumented female state legislator in Arizona. Juan, the sitting state rep, first openly atheist state legislature, legislator in the country and chair of the Arizona Latino Caucus, was challenging his counterpart for the appointed Senate seat. We believe that our slate, filled with an unapologetic progressives from diverse backgrounds, could literally make history. Second, Arizona did something profound long before I decided to run. In 1998, when I was nine years old, the voters of Arizona passed the Clean Elections Act, which created a public matching system for candidates running in legislative and statewide elections. It was a no-brainer that 17 years later, I would decide to follow my progressive values and run clean. Isela and Juan shared in this decision and we branded ourselves the Clean Elections Team. As a Clean Elections candidate, I was not allowed to take PAC money or special interest money. Instead, I had to convince 300 registered voters living in my district to contribute $5 to my campaign. The state then matched those contributions with public funding. As a state legislator, it's been liberating not having to worry about wealthy donors while casting my votes on legislation. <laughs> having the opportunity to run clean was also important for the three of us because we were taking on people who had the power of incumbency and greater connection to money. There is a racial and gender wealth gap that grows every single year, making the cost of running for office a barrier for female and minority candidates. Prioritize, or privatizing our elections also leads to corruption. For those of you who are interested in this topic, I would recommend a book called Republic Lost by Lawrence Lessig. Without clean elections, resisting and overcoming systemic barriers in elections would have proved much more difficult. It was a battle I was prepared to wage, but Isela, on the other hand, would have been much more hesitant and may not have even run at all. Persistence. Local elections are often won by those who work the hardest. My slate knocked on over 30,000 doors, and I personally talked to thousands of voters who lived in my district. It didn't matter how hot the day, how big the dust storm, how much it was raining. Have you guys seen the dust storms in Arizona? <laughs> um, they don't hurt, they just, they kind of hurt. Uh, <laughs> we slug through it all in order to get to that next voter. When candidates are behind in the campaign, they either work harder to make up the difference or they go on the attack. There were four people running for two House seats and two running for one Senate seat. I thus, in the House race, became the main target. The first major incident of sexism I had to navigate occurred almost a week before the deadline for candidates to file their petitions to qualify for the primary ballot. In simpler terms, you turn in your signatures. A local newspaper issued a hit piece titled Lawmaker and Girlfriend Leave Appointed Incumbent to Fend for Herself in Tempe. At no point did the journalist, a white dude, reach out to me for comment nor did he mention any of my accomplishments or qualifications for the position. He only described me as Juan Mendez's girlfriend five times, leaving the impression that the reason I was running was because of my relationship status with Juan. Immediately, I panicked. The article felt gross. Our district chair privately asked the House incumbent female state legislator to make a statement against the sexism in the article in which she refused to. I suppose in her mind, feminism only applies when convenient. Other candidates just echoed the article and attacked me. A friend then suggested that instead of trying to defend myself, which 
puts me in an unwinnable position that my mom submit a letter to the editor calling out the publication on their sexism. So she submitted one and she titled it, Meet My Daughter, MLK Diversity Award Recipient Running for the State House of Representatives. Some um, excerpts of her letter include, quote, for as long as I can remember, the contributions of women have been demeaned because of their gender. In the 1980s, I worked in an optical shop where I was bypassed for two promotions and raises because I was pregnant with my oldest son and then later with Athena. The company also informed me that I was paid less than a male colleague in the same position as I because, quote, he has a family to feed. This is just a snapshot of the sexism I endured before Athena was born. For decades, we have worked hard to ensure that the world is full of positive female role models for our daughters to follow. In fact, Athena's entire life has been devoted to making the world a better place for everyone, especially for women. Regardless of who you support, your ideology or your party, to see a news organization reduce my daughter and all her accomplishments to a relationship status sets all women back." End quote. Another local publication followed my mother's suit and called out the original publication for its sexism. Unfortunately, I lost two days of door knocking trying to respond to this, but importantly, I came out of those attacks on top and in control of the message. I won't spend too much time. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll give a side anecdote. So my mom was my top volunteer knocking on voter doors, talking to voters. And when she introduced herself to a voter, he was like, I read your article and that's when I knew I was voting for your daughter. So it was awesome. It's, it's, it's great when people try to target you and you're, you just turn it around and it helps you win. Uh, <laughs> I won't spend too much time describing the second major episode, but this one was an experience embedded in racism. Key highlights, there were mailers, they were attacking us, people were calling us liars, sending legislators were smashing us. They used ethnic, ethnic images of us to really perpetuate fears. Um, but while this was happening, and this was happening while ballots were out and voters were voting, we, our slate, we doubled down on our door knocking, amped up our call program, and sent more mailers about how great we were. We decided that by staying positive and stubbornly pers persistent, we would win. And yes, we won. As this country gets browner, as more women step up to lead, and as more religious minorities, including atheists like me, demand equality, we must confront a uh, we must confront head on a very real and strong backlash. Power doesn't relinquish itself without a fight. Today, we are witnessing a renewed terror of white supremacy, a belief system established to uphold white cisgendered men as the most valued members of our society. It is no coincidence that Donald Trump comes at the heels of the first black president in American history. Nor is it such that people chose to sit this election out rather than vote for a woman for president. Our president now is attacking entire systems of faith, disparaging immigrants and people of color and demeaning women and LGBTQ individuals. His tirades, are, his tirades are emboldening individuals who seek to cause psychological and physical harm to marginalized communities, as seen last week in Charlottesville. His false equivalency of neo-Nazis and terrorist groups to counter protesters threatens everyone. And on Tuesday, he is heading to Phoenix, Arizona, my beloved state, with potential plans of pardoning our infamous Sheriff Joe the same sheriff who terrorized the Latino communities for decades, was found in contempt of court, and who the voters of Arizona kicked out this last election year. <laughs> the blatant lack of empathy, understanding, and regard for human life and experience by this president is quite breathtaking. We live in times where no one, including you, has the luxury of sitting on the sidelines. To do so is to be, to be complicit in the atrocities that marginalized groups have confronted up until this day. If atheism and our movement is truly a big tent, if we are to be a force to be reckoned with, 
then we need to lift up and support individuals that in addition to facing religious bigotry, have to confront sexism, racism, ableism, ageism, homophobia, and classism on a daily basis. My human experience is shaped by so much of this, as I've shared with you today. And if voices like mine aren't welcome, then people like me will take our voices elsewhere or not engage at all. As more people become non-religious every day, we as a movement need to mature and become more inclusive if we are going to remain relevant. So let's talk about the solutions that we do have. First, have y'all considered running for office? No, I'm serious. Have you considered it? Yeah? Awesome. Too many people at the margins count themselves out of this opportunity because they feel that the burden of overcoming bigotry and hate is heavier than getting the votes needed to win. This is especially true for atheists. To, to this excuse, I say that you can never have Barack Obama without Jesse Jackson, you can never have Hillary Clinton without Geraldine Ferraro. And in my instance, and in the instance of State Senator Juan Mendez, and for many other openly atheist elected officials throughout the country, we did it and we won. And if you don't try it, you can't find out whether or not you will win too. <laughs> did I mention that this atheist received the most votes in the primary and the general election? Voters care more about your positions on issues than they do your religious preference. Also, did you miss the last election cycle? Look who's in the White House. So you really got nothing to hold you back, right? <laughs> if you don't want to run for office, support a candidate whose values reflect your own. Keep an eye open for people who come from backgrounds and communities that are sorely missing in our government. While candidates need your financial support, in order to win elections, especially local ones, they really need people willing to talk to voters regardless of whether it's hot or cold outside. In my primary, it was the dead heat of summer where temperatures reached 110 degrees Fahrenheit where we did the vast majority of our door knocking to talk to voters. Uh, also gets you votes, just so you know. Um, as mentioned yesterday, start, start fighting for the issues grounded in equality as the values that you hold near and dear to your heart because you are an atheist. A lot of my voters know that I'm an atheist. And when they see me fight for public education, when they see me defend women's rights, and when they see me throw down for other religious minorities, it reshapes any preconceived notions that they had about atheists. And it's the right thing to do. As we enter, as we enter into a new civil rights era, I will unapologetically fight for the rights of people from all faith backgrounds, for varying ethnic and racial backgrounds, for women, for the LGBTQ plus community, for individuals with disability, disabilities, for the young and the old, for the economic mobility of everyone, and I will devote my life to bringing down the corporate greed that is plaguing this planet. The future of our movement is intersectional. I can't do this alone, neither can you, but together we can make long-lasting positive change. It is a worthy use of our brief time on Earth. It has been a pleasure speaking with you today, and I thank you again for this time.